Aloha mai kako and good afternoon. It is Wednesday, March 16th. Papa Olo, on behalf of Papa Olo Lokahi, we are happy to have you join this webinar, the third episode of Aola Mau Amau. We will be starting in just a couple of minutes as we let people trickle into the room. Uh, it's 12 noon now. We'll just allow another couple of minutes to let people come in. Meanwhile, we're really interested if you want to put into the chat or into the comments if you're viewing on Facebook, let us know where you are watching from, let us know why you're tuned into this particular episode on mental and behavioral health and wellness. And we'd like to know a little bit about you while we let a few more people come on into the room. We know you're there, we see you, and we will be starting this episode of Aola Mau Amau in just a couple of minutes. Mahalo. Aloha nui kako. Thank you so much for joining us. Aola Mau Amau is an important series to us, and we are really glad that you've joined us. Uh, my name is Kim Kuule Bernie on behalf of Papa Ola Lokahi. Um, we are presenting to you our report back to the community of Aola Mau Amau. You may know that Aola Mau is a landmark Hawaiian health needs assessment that was originally published in 1985. It was the first opportunity where we had the data, where we had the information that demonstrated what we kind of knew already anecdotally. And since 1985, the Aola Mau report has been the benchmark for all measurements of Hawaiian health. There have been and many updates of the Hawaiian health status over the years. Um, Aola Mau Mau was undertaken a couple of years ago and we didn't have a chance to report back to the community. So um, pandemic uh, took a lot of our energy. We put a lot of work into the pandemic. And in 2022, we are now able to report back to the community, report back to you. So you know what the findings were, what the recommendations are, and we hope to seek your input as well. But let's start with a couple of, uh, of housekeeping notes. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and it's being live streamed and cross posted across multiple Hawaiian health and health platforms on Facebook. Um, you are welcome. The panelists are prepared to answer your questions. If you're on Zoom, if you'll put them into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen, we'd appreciate that. If you're viewing on Facebook, put them into the comments and we will find them and we will bring them over to the Zoom. An evaluation is uploaded and when you close out of this webinar, it will be sent to you automatically at the close of the webinar and then again tomorrow morning. So without further delay, Aola Mau Amau, the next generation of Native Hawaiian health. This episode three features uh, highlights behavioral and mental health among Native Hawaiians. We have two extraordinary presenters. Dr. Uh, Debbie Gabert is with the school, with the Department of Psychiatry at the John A. Burns School of Medicine at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She just reminded me that she's been there for 27, perhaps more years there. And she has mentored many researchers 
and her um, a lot of her research has been around suicide among Native Hawaiian youth and Native Hawaiians in general. So we're looking forward to hearing some of that. In her free time, she she likes to spend time with her family and she loves to travel. Uh, we have Kate Leilani Kahuano. Uh, who has deep roots in Santa Cruz, California, and Waianae O'ahu. She's a graduate of the Myron B. Thompson School of Social Work and Public Health, and she's worked in the treatment of substance use for most of her career. She was mentored by Lynette Peglinawan. She, Kate is a haku ho'oponopono and currently the site manager for the Department of Research at the Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center advocating to improve precision medicine. Kate also takes great joy in being a kumu, teaching topics in social welfare, Native Hawaiian perspectives, a cultural context for well-being at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. They've got slides and a lot of good information to share with you. So without delay, uh, I will turn it over. And I believe the first presenter is Dr. Debbie Gabert. Aloha, Deb. Aloha. Thank you so much, Kim, for that introduction. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. This project, I think, was a labor of love for many people. Um, and, I'm, <laughs> and, and these are the group that actually pulled this report together for uh, the mental and behavioral health and well-being section. So as you can see, there were a lot of folks um, sharing their knowledge, sharing work that they had seen and bringing that together, providing their insights as well. So Kate and I are representing um, what I think is a very esteemed group of folks that have been working in um, Native Hawaiian behavioral health. So the first chapter of the, of the report really deals with this increased understanding. And as, as Kim mentioned, you know, when the, when the first ALO Mao report came out, there wasn't a lot of work out there. Native Hawaiians were rarely mentioned in the literature. Um, and when they were mentioned, they were grouped um, with a bunch of other folks. Um, and so when we, we first started, we went back and we're like, well, what's actually out there? What happens when we do a lit search and put in the words uh, Native Hawaiian and mental and or behavioral health? And we came up with over 20,000 scholarly pieces where we're like, well, we're not going to be looking at all of that. <laughs> um, but I do think it, it makes a statement. Um, about recognition, about being included. Um, and so it's important to highlight, even if the, many of those publications were referencing some of the same, same studies that were being done, um, at least it put uh, that field on the map. Um, and so from that standpoint, uh, that number, 20,000, you know, more than 20,000 coming up. Um, and it's more now because I tried to update a little bit and take a look at what was happening. Um, and the beginning work uh, too, I think, ended up focusing on like, what is the extent of the problem? Can, can we identify it? Um, my background of course is in epidemiology, which is just a big word to say we study things. Um, and what do we study? In this case, uh, we're studying usually mental illness um, and not mental health uh, that comes later. Um, or in the case of Native Hawaiian work and what we're looking to historically, if that's where you start. Um, but as far as the literature was concerned, it really, really the focus primarily was on um, mental illness. Um, and then a lot on risk factors. There's this risk factor and there's that risk factor. And so, um, and then the repeated risk factors and then more risk factors and keeping adding on risk factor, risk factor, risk factor. Um, and then fortunately, um, about 20 years ago, we started to see a turn where people said, you know what, maybe we should focus on protective factors and start looking at, at those. Um, and again, we started to see an increase there in terms of the literature. And so we have a much better understanding of, of at least the nature and occurrence and extent of mental illness um, and the vast number of protective factors um, and, and of course, risk factors as well. Um, so what do we know when these studies were done? Well, we do see that there are more mental health challenges faced by Native Hawaiians than by non-Hawaiians. Um, and that there, 
again, because so much focused on risk factors, that there are multiple stressors that folks are dealing with these, you know, and many of those we can think of as the social cultural um, determinants of health now, as we think, you know, situations related to not having land or access to land, not having uh, homes or property, not right, like all of these things that have some historical roots, but then continue to be there. Um, as well as things like racism um, and injustices that occur. Um, fortunately, um, and of course, this is this is where um, most of the folks that participated in this process, our work focuses on, well, how can we tap into strengths and not really focus on all of these other things um, because they're present. Obviously, there's work to be done there, but from from mental and behavioral health standpoint, and from a wellness standpoint, how can we really tap into what contributes to resilience, what contributes to well-being? And pretty much mutual agreement in almost every paper, even if it wasn't the focus of that paper, they talked about the relevance of, of culture and some form and how culture can in fact impact health and well-being. So uh, lots of factors there. Um, strong sense of hope, uh, strong sense of family, strong sense of community, um, and all of those contributing um, into what it means for mental health. So just gonna take a step back. And um, part of this is to show you, you know, how, uh, what the disparities are that we're seeing. And also to show that even with 20,000 reports, there were still some things we couldn't find. Um, so there is still some work to be done there. Uh, so when it came to having any mental health uh, problem, about 32% of youth identified that there was some problem, and this is definitely higher. It's about 1.4 times higher um, than it was in other populations. Typically, we're either comparing to the state as a whole or to Caucasians. Um, whereas once we get to adulthood, some of those disparities start to decrease. Um, and then for our, our elder, for Kapuna, we don't actually have any data. <laughs> um, so we're still missing that. We actually think that it might switch over in the other direction, just based on some of the other types of findings that we have. For example, um, as you move down this table, I think if I use my pointer, no, it's not working. If you move down to suicide attempts and suicide deaths, um, you will see that our Puna have are 3.2 times lower than the state average, whereas um, our young people are definitely struggling with rates 1.3 and 1.7 times higher. So overall, higher rates. This is some recent data um, that that also highlights some of the same thing with respect to suicide. Um, and, and again, you see um, in the light blue color, those are native Hawaiians. Um, and this data comes from the Department of Health um, and goes up to 2019. Um, and you see elevated rates all the way up to 49. And then those rates start to decrease um, for native Hawaiians um, and then become lower. Uh, an important thing to um, note is that we did not see an increase during the pandemic in suicide rates. A lot of people have asked, um, and I have some other information later, but we did not see them in suicide rates, even though this particular chart only goes up to 2019 because it was broken up by ethnicity. Um, this chart is, uh, this table, or. Uh, uh, or map, I should say, which is not <laughs> geographically correct, but does show the islands, <laughs> uh, is really to highlight um, some of the communities and from a community perspective. And you see the high rates are in the areas of, of kind of that reddish pink um, color. Um, and when you see white, that means the communities are too small for us to be able to say something. Um, so uh, clearly you see a connection with the communities that people are living with living as, um, as well as being locations where we have uh, higher numbers of Native Hawaiians. Um, so some of the same issues 
we continue to see during, during COVID that we have identified before in terms of identifying numbers. Um, there was this great, very large study, thousands of people, um, and they opted the, the, the pulse survey to see where, you know, what was going on with psychosocial distress in Hawaii specifically. Um, and they opted to put Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders under other. Um, and so we didn't know. We're like, well, that's not very helpful. <laughs> um, especially when we know that these communities were impacted um, by COVID itself. So um, we had reports, and again, this goes back to that same type of thing where we're always looking at anecdotal information. Um, so we're hearing um, from the call center, you know, the suicide crisis line um, that actually expanded to deal with all stress, that they were getting more, the volumes were going up, um, reports back from hospitals that volumes were going up with people feeling suicidal. Um, we hope that meant that more people were getting help that needed it because we didn't see that parallel in deaths. Uh, this is a great study that did come out and was reported locally um, uh, on the pandemic and looking at anxiety and depression. Um, and basically you see that the rates are not that different. However, if you look overall, um, there are slight increases um, in the number of Native Hawaiians respondents here in, in the kind of the grayish color, um, having more severe illness um, and symptoms uh, and fewer reporting um, having a normal level of symptoms. And this is by the number of symptoms reported. So I'm gonna pause here, I believe, and see if there's any questions um, with respect to sort of that increased understanding that we have. Appreciate that data and particularly appreciate the focus or the shift from risk factors to protective factors. And um, I think that is one question. I'm glad you addressed it so early. I think one important question is, we know that Aola Mao Amal was completed before the pandemic, but what are, you know, what are we seeing as a result? So this has been really um, helpful and also discouraging at the lack of data specifically for Native Hawaiians. Um, for COVID, we're the only state that disaggregates Native Hawaiians from Pacific Islanders. We're not even grouped with other folks but I can see that that's not the same for other areas such as mental and behavioral health. Yeah, thanks for that. And you know, what's, what's really exciting, and, and I'm gonna to turn to Kate because she's gonna talk about promising approaches, but there is some literature in, in that increased understanding piece that really shows that by focusing on protective factors, you can have a much larger impact than you can if you focus on risks. So we kind of spent a lot of time, money, effort, really taking risk approaches when all along we knew we should be taking a strength-based approaches. So. Of course, of course. All right, I think we do have a question here. Um, I hope you touch on epigenetics. Well, ah, I, I wonder if Kate, do you wanna take that since you are working in, in some of that area with the uh, precision medicine? Thank you. Um, so I hadn't planned on doing that. Um, so this is off the top of my head and the little bit of time that I've spent at YNI Comp um, working in the research department. But you know, we are doing our best to try and create more seats at these tables that have already been created to look at the connection between our genetics, between our lifestyle, between the different things that we interact with to get a way better picture of what's possible for us and then just the pathology or the, the history, history that is not always captured when we have anecdotal information or when we have um, you know testimonies about things, but really looking at the makeup of our people and what's specific to us. So that's the only thing I can really offer at this point in connection to that. But I definitely think that um, the study that I'm helping um, invite people to participate in White and I is to collect blood samples, to collect urine samples, and to collect 
survey information about their lifestyles to try and broaden the scope of precision medicine, to allow it to accurately be precision medicine for those who are from diverse cultures, from those who are us. And so right now, medicine and how we treat medicine is based off of the model of white men typically. And so collecting blood, collecting um, actual information from those sources is going to really just, and already they started research in connection to the study that we've done with the samples that we've been given. White and I is new to this study, so it's not necessarily, again, disaggregated to Hawaiian specifically, but just continuing the conversation of diverse information that better reflects communities and how to heal these communities with their input. Um, That's great, Kate, thank yeah. you so much. I know we've been talking a lot about, um, about having some community presentations and um, scoping really find out how our Hawaiian community feel, feels about precision medicine. So I think this is another whole topic that we can uh, go deep on and maybe have another, uh, at least a couple of programs. Um, but let's get back to behavioral and mental health and um, tell us more about the wise and promising approaches. Okay, mahalo. Um, so I'm, I'll go ahead and read this to us. The primary value of our community is service. A community is not a community if nobody's giving of themselves. The value of family and togetherness only comes to light when people give unconditionally. The giving of oneself, which we loosely translate as aloha, is at the heart of every thriving community. And this is from Dr. Kimo Alameda. And you know, the main takeaway here I, I encourage is that, that aloha and how it's connected with community. But I also want to add kuleana and the kauna or hidden meaning or, you know, hopefully obvious meaning is also the privilege that comes with serving your community. And so I invite us to really see kuleana as a privilege, which lends so beautifully to aloha and how when you take the unconditional approach to your kuleana, it is such an effortless way to give aloha and you get so much in, in return. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so here we talk about effective and promising approaches. So the mentality that can help that and then maybe the way we can do that. So we um, want to focus on strengths, community, culturally informed practices the need to experience a sense of belonging and sense of place. Um, an individual may have damaged pilina with relationships with ohana or feel deeply unworthy, but the, the kaina, um, our, our land, one's culture can be a safe place, providing aloha, acceptance, and a rooted value system that's all unconditional. The making of, um, you know, integrate, integrating native ways is essential. And balance is key here too, to the Hawaiian, but also in this respect, that we wanna try to find the perfect meeting place of Western best practices and the native approaches. And so here we're talking about those being served. What are ways to effectively serve those who are seeking out services and ensure they have access to those services? So overall, we're encouraging a reconnection. So when I work with people, I never introduce new behaviors. To those I serve, I say, let's reestablish, let's return to. And I commit to the idea that wellness was once was for a person, but especially the indigenous person, that our culture tells us abundantly that wellness can be achieved, maintained, and it can be reestablished. And our culture is going to withhold all of those versions of ourselves, of our community, and of the aina, of the land. So a quick example that I'll offer is, I worked at Women's Way, which is a leg of Salvation Army, working with makuahine, mothers and their children. So they come to our facility, a residential treatment facility, with their children. So side by side, we hope to work with them. I will offer um, a lauhala weaving activity, and the women, um, sometimes we'll take it really quickly. They'll have a skill that's very um, obvious, very quickly. And so I'll go up to the wahine, to the mokuahine, the mother, the woman, and I'll ask her, wow, how incredible. You, with your clear mind and clear body, look what you're creating. Have you done this before? And she will sometimes tell me, yes, I've done it with my tutu. And then we'll sit there and talk about her tutu. 
Other times, and more likely, they'll say, no, I've never done this. And then I'll say, wow, can we look at your mo'oku'ahau? Can we go into your genealogy? It could be that you are a, have a weaver in your ohana and you are have inherited the mana of that person and your skill is coming from something that is in your family, that is deep inside you, anchored. And, you know, the hope here in this example is that I've honored her strength and her skill. I've encouraged a reconnection with her culture through this activity, through this conversation. I've also acknowledged her body and her mind and her ohana. And I've established possibly a seed of spirituality in the transfer of mana and considering things bigger than herself that led to this opportunity of skill. And most likely, this causes a manifestation of practiced values and behavioral change towards sustainable wellness. So that's an example that um, kind of brings to life these different bullet points. If we can go to the next slide, thank you. So again, let's talk about this idea of increased capacity um, to address needs through training and clinical service, which integrate culture and community-based perspectives. While populations being served tend to be multicultural, programs designed tend to be initiated and led by Native Hawaiians. So here we're talking about those that serve. Um, again, connection, sharing, that giving of self is maintained. As mentioned, my mentor is Anake Lynette Paglina Wan. She always encourages the idea that one must be Pono when they are hoping to help others achieve Pono. And therefore, cultural integration has this reciprocal nature. And the Aloha and Kuleana worldview has profound effects, making healing and wellness possible for all included. Also, the Aina and incorporating Akua, the powers that be. So it's the, the effect is not only in the person that is healed, but a shared opportunity of wellness for the community and for those helping in achieving wellness. And again, returning to wellness. I really appreciate that idea that we were all once well. How can we get back there? How can we keep staying there? Um, thank you so much. Next slide. So this is just, again, we want to stay as current as we can and continue to move forward. Um, so, you know, recent review of broad sources under the Hawaiian worldview shows similar findings. Connection to place and cultural identity can overcome adversity. Promotion of Hawaiian culture as intervention is mentioned here. And as Deb said, and I will repeat, prevention. And then, um, you know, this ability that we can move beyond just cultural grounding, but to ways of knowing. You know, it's been said that our na'au is the seat of knowing. And so culture is not separate from our ability to know, from our ability to ex um, experience place and connection to place, to acknowledge and to understand sacred sites, and to also encourage um, this inclusion of spirituality. And that can look, you know, many different ways. Um, and, and I try to encourage those that I teach and those that I work with to just talk about spirituality as ways of culture, not necessarily ways of organized religion or these specific ways, but just talk about the importance of poi at a dinner. You know, we cover our poi and we open it when we're ready to consume it. But we also are very careful with our behaviors around poi because we understand that as our eldest sibling and we don't want our negativity um, the heaviness of what might be happening before dinner as we're all rushing to do something to seep into that. So spirituality can come in so many different ways. And so I think we're so blessed as cultural healers to have these things come together and for us to see this consistently in the information that is gathered about us and our practices and the effectiveness of when they're used authentically. Um, Okay, I think I'll pass it back to you, Deb, unless there's questions or anything that I can um, comment about. No, that was really excellent. I love um, the phrase practice values. You know, it's been a long time, but notice how neither, well, to the audience that we're not talking about best practices because a long time ago, we realized that best to whom or for whom. So we got into wisdom and wise practices and, uh, you know, informed 
um, informed practices. And now, of course, you have practice values. And I really love that phrase that you used. And, you know, I've been looking it up recently myself. And also your idea of return to wellness. So before we get into the gaps, there's uh, an important question somebody asked um, elsewhere about uh, from F from Facebook. Um, how do I access continuing education credits or units uh, for your profession? So uh, in full transparency, Papa Ola Lokahi is not offering continuing education credits for this six week series. But um, depending on what your profession is, whether it's social work or public health or nursing, whatever it is, perhaps you can get category two uh, credits, but a check with your own accrediting body for your profession and see what may be possible for you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Kate. And let's go back to Deb. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I just want to comment, I think there's so much overlap. And although Kate's work is in, you know, has been primarily in the substance use area, um, and my work is primarily in, in suicide, uh, when we get down to looking at cultural values, it's universal. Um, and I'm thinking, oh, you just last, you know, last week, you talked about kind of the historical cultural aspects. I'm like, well, that's it. That's that's what we're talking about here. So there's really this overlap. And, um, you know, so it just really reminds me that, that really that's what we're talking about when we're talking about what kinds of programs are needed. Right. You know, we have a whole separate, in fact, the 1985 version had a whole separate chapter on his the historical and cultural perspectives of health but in fact every other chapter referenced the importance of culture and acknowledging the history so uh it is both a separate chapter and integrated throughout all the work that you folks are doing yeah, absolutely so um, thank you thank you oh uh, so that was the fun part i have to i'm going to talk about gaps <laughs> Not so fun. Um, we do have a long way to go. I alluded to it in the beginning because we can't look at this whole breadth of, of review. Um, and again, we did look at both things that were published as well as stories that were told um, and, and not see that we've still got some, some ways to go um, in terms of capturing um, what it means. Um, and we're not even at the community level, which we know there are community differences as well. We're still fighting to get Native Hawaiians captured in a regular basis for every single data set, you know, nationwide. Um, and so we have a lot to go there and it's not consistently defined. And, and you know, what are we talking about when we do that? Are we talking about um, blood quantum? Um, is that the definition? Are we talking about um, primary identity? Or, you know, what do we do with all the many, many mixed identities and how is that captured? Um, so there's so many different ways uh, to go with that. And so one of the things is that we need to start um, and put those that information out there on a universal basis. And I think that through the process, at least there were discussions um, with various agencies in order to try and start moving in that direction. Um, and then uh, the disparities that we've seen have um, really a limitation. Oftentimes we say this is people attribute and put causal definition on being Native Hawaiian when some of the issues are really accessibility issues to services, um, absence of different types of services. Uh, and and we so we call areas, and this is my own pet peeve, so I'll try not to gut, get on my high horse, my very, very high horse um, when I talk about talk, uh, high risk communities, which I think is a horrible way to define a community. Um, as, as rather than under-resourced communities, um, which I think is what we're really, really talking about. Um, in terms of the culturally based programs, and I struggle with this um, as well, the funding and for the work that I do in suicide prevention often comes from the federal government um, and they require us to use evidence-based programs. Um, and so that, it's no money or get money, but you have to do an evidence-based program. And so my work has tended to focus on adapting those programs when we know there's actually already programs that exist in community that are value-based, that are very successful 
um, and have been working, but we can't get those funded. Um, and many of those are programs, um, as Kate spoke to, in terms of spirituality um, and those and that type of assessment. But where we end up, well, let's try and make this fit. Well, guess what? Yes, we get better than if we don't try to make it fit and we don't go through that process of looking at the culture, um, but is at as good as it can be if we, you know, weren't able to use what is, you know, a value-based program right from the beginning. And that probably would have the biggest impact, but we're not there yet. So one of the big gaps is we have to start showing demonstration in order to make it affordable. Those are the rules, I don't write them. <laughs> but the more that we can get out there in published um, literature, uh, the more we're gonna be able to argue that these should be funded at least from a federal government standpoint. So um, in order to do that, um, we need to be a little bit more systematic in our approach, right? And that's, that's really, um, what Dr. Koholokua was getting at um, in this statement. Um, and and uh, for those that have not seen the full report, the quotes that are in here are because during the process, we realized that people were saying things were like, we want it said just like that. <laughs> and let's try to capture it. Or we went to them to see what their opinion was on it. And so we, we started including those as well. Um, so they are throughout the a very large report um, in your spare time when you want to go back and read that. <laughs> um, so really what we're looking to do is to say that it, it's, uh, it's not enough just to say it's Hawaiian. It, we have to look at what the intended outcomes are, what it is we want to measure, what we're trying to do, um, and maybe turn it. Uh, I think that's a lot of what we're saying. Um, what do we mean when we say well-being? Uh, and that and that's a very different, you know, in that process, and it's one of the huge gaps. Um, how do we go about defining that for the community? Um, I remember, uh, and Kate, you, this may ring true for some of the work and that you've done in substance use, but I, I remember working with the community um, on on substance use, and they said, "Well, we know we've made an impact when people start stop throwing their cigarette butts on the ground." And why is that? Because aloha aina, right? As soon as, and I'm like, that is a positive outcome. That's not on anybody's scale. That's not being measured in any way. I haven't seen a single scale that assess, you know, don't throw your butts on the ground, right? So that's what we need to move to, but that takes a systematic approach and we need to capture it. And that will help increase funding in this area as well. Um, so that is it for gaps, um, big gaps, as you see, in terms of how we measure Hawaiian and Hawaiian-ness, um, whether we're getting things out there in a manner that's going to allow us to access all sorts of funding, um, and then really taking a hard look at what we mean by well-being and health. Um, from that standpoint in order um, to truly capture what it what that that is and what is Pono. Thanks, Deb. That's really key. So often we know that we need to look at, uh, we need to improve accessibility. We need to improve availability. We need to improve appropriateness. But um, it's not often that we have the conversation about redefining or reshaping what is well-being, what is wellness. So thank you so much. So next, do we have recommendations? We do. If there are no questions, we can move on. Thank you, Deb. Um, okay, so recommendations for impact. So again, this, this idea to promote community engagement, which improves reintegration and social networking. Consider and engage the ohana, not just the individual that we are serving. So when I'm working with Makuahine, mothers and their children, I, I'm asked, you know, who's my client? I have a child, I have a, a mother, and I always say that the pilina, the relationship is my client, that I really see it that way, that I want to serve as many people as I can, and I want the healing to be felt by as many people as I can, as many people as it can. And so um, 
you know, we as Hawaiians, um, those who practice Hawaiian values understand that, you know, you cannot separate us from our ohana. And so sometimes our, our um, you know, disconnection can be felt by the family. And so why can't we understand that health can be felt by the whole family? Um, so that's something really important. There's also a push um, for collaboration, you know, which again, this is consistent with the Ahupua'a system, with our understanding of kuleana, that each doing their part with the aina towards a sustainable system and sharing of resources is this mentality that is practiced, you know, and still continues to have essence in our ways of seeing the world today. So again, these are not new ideas. Um, this is our approach to returning to Pono and ways of healing that are sustainable. So this community approach, this collaborative approach is super, super important. And then, you know, of, of course, we want to continue to um, expand culturally based and adapted prevention and treatment. Um, and then we talked about, I think, is it the next slide? No. Okay. Yeah. Um, so approaches that can prevent challenges. And, and I love this idea of prevent challenges, but I also know that Deb, briefly touched upon this about these concepts and these ideas that are attached to Hawaiians and and what they're at risk for and so you know there are people who say that you know being born Hawaiian puts you in a certain category for a certain trajectory of life and so I kind of want to mention that of course these ideas will hopefully equip our um, keiki, those who we serve, to meet these challenges and do them in well wellness ways or do them in ways that are consistent with their values and their culture and that's supported by the um, help that they're getting. So the, you know, the hope is, is that, um, you know, when I work with the Makuahine, when I worked with them and their children and we explore, you know, the mo'olelo of Maui snaring the sun, and that, he did that for his mother. And that is how the story is told. And I ask my clients and I say, you know, can you imagine your keiki being so loved, feeling so safe that they, when they see the sky, they think that they can capture it. And so, you know, we have this idea that for that child, given the resources, given the love, given support, there's no obstacle that they can't um, master. There's nothing that can come into their lives or any dream that they have that they shouldn't have stories and parents and values in the home that tell them you can do it or we can do it together and let me help you and so i just again you know perfect perfect pre preventive pre <laughs> call my prevention and protective factors they're just so key to us they're so clear to us in the research and into the in the work that i've done culture is so powerful um okay we'll go to the next slide so here we go again, this idea of ensuring access. So we want our um, consumers, our community members to have access to these resources. And it is possible that when we have people who appear to practice our same values, to appear to look like we look and to have this general authenticity in how they serve their community, it's going to attract people to engage in wellness. And the hope is, is that we can ensure access and simultaneously decrease stigma. That when we talk about returning to wellness versus you're sick, come to my office, let's talk about it. That just changes the invitation. And so, you know, really, this need for responsive and proactive system of care, which includes cultural approaches um, that are seen, felt, witnessed, shared. Um, and then, you know, increasing workforce development and training for native peoples. Again, you know, it can't be possible for us to have these systems if us as healers are not supported to be able to achieve what we need in order to serve our communities. So a, a thing that is mentioned here is that there's a shortage that impacts the outer islands at a greater rate. And when we look to the outer islands and the people that exist there, cultural practices are, happen in ways that they might be more increased than on Oahu, where a lot of services might appear to be more accessible. So again, you know, we lose out in different ways when we really don't allow the, a community approach of empowering healers who then can serve the, the communities properly and effectively and the way that their consumers, their patients, their, their um, community members are asking for. 
Um, the other thing that that we talk, just real brief, um, thank you. Um, this idea of um, client-centered approach within the context of their environment and their culture. And um, I just really want to kind of highlight that, that we want to, you know, understand the, the client who's in front of us in the culture of their, in the context of their culture, in the context of their environment. And again, we can, we can touch so many different opportunities of healing when we see that whole picture of the person. Um, okay. So I'm looking at time, so I think I have a, some time to highlight this as well. When you have a well-informed, educated, culturally grounded Hawaiian health professional, that will make the greatest influence in helping a Hawaiian individual change. So it talks about, um, you know, the, and I'm going to go to the bottom here. The greatest impact is when we use our own heritage, our cultural practices, rituals, language, proverbs, mo'olelo, and helping it to heal the individual. I've had, and this is um, said by somebody um, who has experience, I've had more success in developing that technique and it's much more powerful. So again, when we understand healing as a community approach and a responsibility that is shared by those who are trying to um, return to wellness as the patient seeking services, but also as the person healing, that we all share in this kuleana. We all can have the privilege of practicing wellness and it be shown by different avenues, different um, opportunities, and it can be experienced by the individual, the ohana, and the community, and we can incorporate the aina and the powers that be as a whole approach to wellness. Um, and so I'm just so appreciative. We'll go to the next slide and I'll talk a little bit more about what Dev kind of highlighted. This idea that these mentality can best be carried out with the support of funding. And so we can't, you know, not end on that, not talk about that in the sense of recommendations, that when we are able to increase funding holistically, um, then we are able to have more sustainability. So we want to encourage, we see the need for incorporate systems that approach um, this and utilizes a socioeconomic socio-ecological model that focuses on long term and one of the things that mentioned here is effective leadership you know how can we take the people in the different avenues to come together to be able to have the funding they need to do those specific services but talk about them as offered to the whole to the person and how can we all come together as a systems approach that is properly funded properly led and reflective of the community that they hope to serve. Um, so that is kind of what I have had prepared as far as um, recommendations for impact, but I'm sure, um, you know, we're willing to answer any questions in relation to that specific area or kind of as a whole. Um, so anything else that we can do or talk about, um, we want to be of service to you folks and take great honor in doing that. So thank you guys for this opportunity. Beautiful presentation, Kate and uh, Debbie. So um, we do have some people that have questions, and I just want to encourage the viewers, the listeners, to please put your questions either in the comment section or in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your Zoom webinar, or even in the chat if that's easier for you. Um, here's one question. How do caring community members and families help to recognize and prevent child and elder abuse in Native Hawaiian families before it's too late? Are there tools, strategies, real solutions to help the most vulnerable? So that's a very loaded question and I appreciate the tenderness and the asking of it. And I think that we could, you know, talk a lot about that. Um, my hope is, is that, you know, we have clear, you know, hotline numbers that we can call in the sense of if something needs to happen um, as far as intervention, you know, we have support and crisis numbers that can be acknowledged. Um, but, you know, our most vulnerable populations tend to be, um, you know, cared for by other populations. And so my hope is, is that we not only acknowledge those vulnerable populations, but those who are, you know, the, the people serving them. And so really, really, really establishing the idea of wellness for caregivers, 
um, and really trying to acknowledge the, the kuleana of a caregiver, the kuleana of a parent, and make it safe to talk about the things that are, make it difficult to care for people and just start these conversations um, and normalize these conversations before they start to have consequences and effect onto those vulnerable populations. So I kind of just encourage um, for crisis intervention, you know, utilize hotlines, call out to service providers, talk to, um, you know, medical professionals if you have that as your access to getting wellness right now. But also really how do we support the caregivers and the parents um, to understand what is Pono and what is, um, you know, best for their Ohana. Deb, I don't know if you have anything that you want to say specific to services. That's just kind of a general. Yeah, and I'm actually going to go back to prevention um, and just <laughs> talk about, you know, some, some of the work um, statewide that's being done. Um, and, and it goes back to tapping into the community, I think. And that's really, and, and Kate, when you said that the privilege of Kuleana. Um, so from a suicide prevention standpoint, some of the things that have been proposed by uh, communities kind of across the state in, in different ways is to have people take responsibility for their neighborhood, whatever that is, their street, their cul-de-sac, something broader. I mean, people are already doing it, but be recognized as the person to do that. So if somebody sees something, then they know who they can go to um, and talk to them and let's make that a little bit more obvious. So it taps on a lot of different things that we're here because so much of that is related to stigma and, oh, I'm not going to bring that up. Or, you know, maybe it's related to something we just don't talk about, but people probably know is going on. Um, and so who, who are these aunties and uncles in the community that you can really turn to? Um, and it's for all, it, it, it will end up working for every single age, right? Um, and so at least in our work that work that was tapped into was the need for everything to be intergenerational. It is based on relationships, right? We're just repeating the same thing over and over again. And that's where those caring communities, those caring contacts, those caring, right? Like just put care in front of it. What are we talking about? We're talking about Aloha and Kuleana and then done. We're, that's then you've got all of the wellness taken care of. <laughs> And um, are there suicide hotlines or services that are specific to Native Hawaiians? You know, interestingly, um, the first uh, suicide hotline that was established in Hawaii was um, developed by, by the Waianae community. Um, and they felt that there was a need and they set up the hotline. Since then, um, of course, now we have a statewide system. Um, the, the CARES line, um, which has you know evolved and changed, so it's gone beyond the crisis line. Um, soon we're going to have this you know nine eight eight number starting in in um, July, where everybody can dial nine eight eight. So it'll be like the ambulance service. One of the things that's come up in the um, in the suicide prevention network um, is that there is a need to try and make sure we have lines for people to talk to people, uh, other folks that might be able to relate more to their circumstance, whatever that may be. And how do we start capturing that? We do not have it. Um, we don't have it in different languages, um, which that would be amazing, right? Can you imagine if you called the crisis line and someone could speak to you and Olelo Hawaii? I mean, that would be spectacular, but we're not there yet, but the ideas are being put forth. Um, and so maybe perhaps at some point in the future. And, and by the way, anyone needs to reach out uh, in crisis, they can always call 1-800-273-TALK, 1-800-273-8255. have to give that number since we've talked about it. <laughs> yeah, we do have to get that number and we'll put it out. Uh, let's put it out on, on uh, let's put that out on our Facebook page too. Um, Momi, thank you so much, um, Debbie. That's a really, uh, a really important one. And um, also uh, at Papua Lokahi, we take a little bit of pride in um, Pua Santos, Kaninao Santos, who has really been a leader and a champion in suicide prevention, particularly among youth based on her own family's experience. And because of that experience, she decided to go into social work and she's a recipient of the Native Hawaiian Health Scholarship Program. Uh, that we administer. So we're super proud of her work. Um, we've got just a few more minutes before we go to closing comments. Here's a question. Mahalo for sharing. 
Um, part of what I hear to help open up these invitations and pathways to wellness is the funding of culturally integrated approaches that may be effective but aren't established in the evidence base. What are some of your thoughts to resolve these barriers so that these opportunities can become more available to families and communities? Yeah, I really think it is. Um, it's we have to become proponents for that. So right now, for example, uh, the National Institute of Health has a call for comments on research in Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders um, groups. And so we need to say this is what's needed. You've got to you've got to be able to fund this type of program. If you're not asking for it, then people will not be submitting, and we can't get that get that done. Um, so that's kind of at that national level. I think there's other avenues to do that. Um, but I also think there's there are other steps that we can be taking. Um, I think that, that you know, we've had some starts at trying to get uh, traditional healing reimbursed um, and um, starts and stalls, I should say, <laughs> right, in that process. Um, and it always comes like, well, how can you credential? And how can it's like, we just have to start defining it. Um, because if we don't put it out there and start looking at um, how that can actually be accomplished, then, then it's not going to happen. Um, and maybe we put it out there and we make mistakes. That's okay. I think we have to be willing to make the mistakes so that we can move the system forward. Just try, yeah, just try. <laughs> Here's a question. Is there a difference? Aloha kehau. Is there a difference in results between Hawaii-based Native Hawaiians and Hawaiians who live elsewhere? outside of the islands. Do we have any data? Yeah, you know, there's increasing numbers, right, in terms of where Native Hawaiians are living. And as those numbers have increased, um, particularly along the West and, and, and Vegas, I guess, <laughs> the West Coast and, and Vegas, that's how I kind of think of it. Um, but uh, we are starting to see some of those findings come in. Uh, and most people, you know, we look at why have people left the islands, um, it tends to get to be because they're trying to do better financially, um, and maybe perhaps fewer financial struggles. Um, but in terms of the findings, at least so far, they've been pretty similar. Um, in, in terms of that, um, I do think it's interesting, they still create communities. So even though Native Hawaiians are leaving right there, <laughs> they're still creating Native Hawaiian communities and linking up. In, in other places to maintain practices. So we still have that connection. Yep, they always find each other. Doesn't matter what state, Hawaiians find Hawaiians. Hawaii people find Hawaii people. Um, I don't know if you two can see the Q&A panel there, but we have a nice um, we have a nice little bit of information by Jessica, who's a librarian on Maui. And um, she is working with the NLM, the National Library of Medicine, to encourage and StoryCorps to encourage conversations around health and wellness. The power or mo'olelo and stories to heal is so important as a librarian who does outreach. Is there an I, I have one more thing I'm going to say, but let me pose a question, her question, Jessica's question. Is there any way I can connect with oh, Papa Olilokahi or other organizations and support one another in our efforts to serve our communities? And on behalf of Papa Olilokahi, I first want to tell you that my grandmother was also a mobile librarian on the island of Maui in 1940 where she drove a truck down to Hana and it took a whole day. And then it took the next day to drive back there. Um, so I would love to talk with you. And um, we do have a, a small kind library at Papa Ololokahi. And we are in the process of developing a Native Hawaiian um, health archive. We've got a couple of collections. Uh, let's go to, and I think this is Jan. Um, appreciate the focus on prevention and protective factors for Native Hawaiians. It sounds like the whole change should happen on that side. I think what should not be forgotten is the role of the other cultures, especially Westerners, play here for Native Hawaiian health and how they should change when you think about things like a colonial mindset, resource allocation, equity, humility, and respect. From a systems perspective, this also plays an important role. Aloha in everyone's heart. Uh, and I don't know if that's Jan or Jan, but I think I was introduced to this person yesterday, and so I think it's Jan. 
either of you. Any no. comments on his comment? I mean, I'm going to agree. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know why I'm like, I'm not, that wasn't quite a question, but it was an excellent sure. comment. <laughs> I certainly support that. I, I think we do have to do these things in, in tandem. Um, because if you don't have the other, you're, you're, you know, you're going to run into walls and that's not fun. So um, we definitely have to have to do that process simultaneously. So develop for Hawaiians and develop for the context for the environment in which Hawaiians are. And I think I'll just mention Aloha Kapu or Kapu Aloha, you know, that that is an invitation to talk about things, you know, and to make things sacred on a basis that is a human level as about connection. And so I think that I just really love that our, you know, kingdom really understood the importance of its citizens, you know, not of you know, people who are Hawaiian, but those who um, want to partake in the nation of, you know, healing, the nation of, you know, loving this beloved Aina. And so I just invite as many as possible to be a part of this conversation. And because as Deb mentioned, you know, there's so many parallels and at the root of the healing for the indigenous is, you know, such a shared approach to humanity. And so I appreciate that comment because we don't want to at all make anyone feel alienated. We want to invite and whoo as many people as we can to come and partake. Right. We're going to have to wrap this up. And I'm sorry about that. We, uh, we're, we'll go over another a couple of minutes just to be able to say mahalo to everybody. And of course, um, Auntie Loretta asks about uh or there was uh, in the 90s, there was a culturally based program in Nanakuli called Hale Ho'opakolea. And I know Bunny Victor or uh, uh, um, known, well, we know her now as um, Analika Nahulu started back in the 90s. Does that still exist? Hale Ho'opakolea? I'm not, I, I'm not sure. I don't want to comment on it without knowing wholeheartedly. Um, yeah. yeah, we have homework to do, Auntie Loretta. We'll check on that. Uh, mahalo for all the mahalos that you folks are sending to our panelists. I want to give a big mahalo to uh, to Debbie Gabert, Dr. Debbie Gabert at the Department of Psychiatry at the Johnny Burns School of Medicine and to Kate Kahuano, who does a lot of work in community and particularly at YNI Coast Comprehensive Health Center. You will notice that um, uh, thank you. Uh, I also want to mahalo Hale Imi, which is our research and data department at uh, Halea Papa'ola Lokahi and Tersha Ku, who shepherds Aola Mau Amau, and who will soon be reaching out across the community, across the Lahui, to get more input as we do the next refresh, the next update to Aola Mau Amau. Mahalo to all of our cross post partners, our Native Hawaiian healthcare systems, the Native Hawaiian Center of Excellence, Aha. Huyona Kauka and Next Gen, and to the folks in the back of the house that you're not seeing, mahalo for the tech support, Momi Keabe and Kamuela Mahalo Nui. Uh, you will see on the screen that we've got a couple of slides here. Next week on March 23rd, we'll be featuring uh, our medical section, our medical report featuring Dr. Martina Kamaka and Dr. Heather Haynes, family practitioners. Dr. Kamaka is on Oahu, Dr. Heather Haynes is on Maui, and um, they will be the presenters next Wednesday at 12 noon. And then we've got two more after that, nutrition and, over, and oral health on March 30th, and then health workforce and data governance will be featured in town on April 6th. Mahalo to everybody for joining us today and for your comments and for your wisdom. Uh, we look forward to getting input from you and reflecting on our report. Um, thank you for joining us, Deb, Kate, Aloha Nui, and to all, Eola Mau, Amau. <laughs>